While the Allied armies lay like great engines poised on the left bank of the Rhine, day after day and night after night, the air forces went out. Rocket firing typhoons attacked German marshalling yards, command posts, rolling stock and troop dispositions. The onslaught reached heights of fury never equaled even in Normandy. The Hawk was taken out of the German transport. After them, the bombers, terrifying in their numbers, delivering blows greater than any Germany had ever felt before. the city of Würzburg. Remember Coventry? Remember Rotterdam? Remember Warsaw? The full horror of war returns to Germany. Everything is made ready for the armies to cross and a tremendous airborne army will strike ahead of them. Into their gliders, they load jeeps and guns, field pieces and munitions, whole regiments of equipment. For the airborne army may have to be self-sufficient for days until it is relieved. Here are the men of that army, the men who will ride the gliders, men of a British airborne division. This is the tent's last moment before the takeoff. For some of them, the last moment that they will ever stand on English soil. In this war, men have learned many things, and not the least of which is a kind of cold-blooded courage fit for exploits such as this. Some of these men have landed in North Africa, in Sicily, in France, at Nijmegen and Arnhem. Now they will land on the far side of the Rhine. They are on their way. sight of England, the first sight of France. Paratroops, these are Americans on an airstrip somewhere in France. They too are going in on the great operation. The scale of this undertaking staggers the imagination, and yet all of it moves like some gigantic clockwork. Everything in its place at its proper time. but one plane cannot make it with its tremendous load. But the rest go on, the gap is filled. They fly through the smoke of the still burning wreck. Over and over again, the planes go out. As the British, so their comrades, the American glider troops. Opposite Santon and Vesel, the British will take the north and center, the Americans the southern flank. Here, for the first time in a combat operation, the experiment is being made of each plane towing not one, but two gliders.
one high, one low, to avoid the risk of crashes in midair. In the paratroop planes, the men are waiting for the jump. Here too, an innovation. The men will go out both sides of the plane at once, and so land in tremendous force in just half the time it formerly took. In the tow planes, the pilots pull at the release catches, and the gliders slide free. Down goes the artillery, down goes the transport, down goes the munition of this airborne army. They are on the ground, they are beyond the Rhine. With one terrific blow, they have begun the last great battle in the West. Now they will unload, deploy, and drive forward for their objectives. The crossroads, the bridges, the strong points, which might hinder the land armies thrusting along behind them. Meanwhile, on the west bank of the Great River, amphibious tanks of the British Second Army are crossing in a never-ending stream. Like ungainly monsters out of some prehistoric age, they lumber down the muddy banks. A whole night of concentrated fire has wiped out the gun positions that might have stopped them. And while they are crossing to establish a bridgehead, other tanks, half-tracks, and heavy guns will be ferried over or cross on the pontoons that engineers are busily building. These are troops of General Simpson's 9th Army. This is part of the tremendous force that is breaking the German line in the West. Starting at 21 hours on the 23rd of March and continuing all through the night and following day, the reinforcements pour across. The enemy's river line is gone. His secondary positions are overrun. Into the broad Westphalian plain that stretches 260 miles to Berlin, the tanks and troops start driving forward. They have a rendezvous to keep with the Red Army, and they intend to be on time. Already the first prisoners from the East Bank are waiting to be ferried across. Beaten, disorganized, and dejected, they had seen the beginning of the end. And whom do they encounter in midstream but the irrepressible Prime Minister, who has come to see for himself? With Field Marshal Montgomery and American generals of the 21st Army Group, Mr. Churchill crosses the Rhine and comes ashore. Pulling on his cigar in obvious satisfaction, he chats with a group of British Tommies. And though his aides try in vain to dissuade him, he insists on touring the ground from which German troops had been driven only a few hours before. Shell and mortar fire landed not 50 yards away. Later, he takes a look at German positions still under fire. With General Eisenhower, he watches the artisans of victory who, from east and west, are driving the giant blows, speeding the hour the whole world has awaited for over five bitter years. 